Okay, so uh, I'll try in, uh, in uh, my time available, and I try to put a timer not to go beyond, um, to give you a little journey of the impact technology. I worked in Deutsche Bank until uh, March 31st, and now I change responsibilities. So I'll try to give you an aspect not only on the technology impact of AI and some other technologies in uh, financial industries, but also beyond. Uh, just one quick information. This picture that you see in, uh, behind, uh, this is a picture of something that was developed in 1949. Lucio Fontana is an Italian uh, artist, a painter, uh, was uh, particularly crazy in his uh, ideas, and he developed this kind of structure which was totally neon. It was supposed to cover the ceiling of Triennale in Milano during the exhibition 1949. So he was too ahead of the time, right, at that time, and now if you try to buy one of his paintings, normally they range between three and five million pounds just to buy it. The second reason why I use this one, because I apparently also I noticed that it matches exactly the logo the company represents, so that's also the reason why I use it. So AI, before we talk about AI, I think it's important that we have at least a common understanding on the data, right? And if we have a common understanding on data, on big data, uh, why is AI important? Uh, and what I've tried to, to address is that no matter why you want to use AI, you must ask yourself, what am I going to do with it? Right? There are companies like uh, PayPal, and they use AI in order to reduce fraud. Other companies like Amazon, in order to understand the propensity, anticipate the customer needs, and make a business model out of that. Other companies like banks like JP Morgan, they use AI because they realize that they can use something that reduced 360,000 hours of the lawyers, so it's an impact on their costs. So the first question is, why do I want to use it? And what is the benefit for me and for, for my company before I embark on a journey and try to follow a trend? And if you have that answer, probably you decide to invest. Uh, but before you do that, we need to have an understanding of why it is important, why we cannot use human beings anymore. If we agree that big data is changing the shape and form, it's not only transactional, it's not only mechanical data, but it's images, video, socials, any kind of shape and form, the question we need to ask ourselves is, can a human being interpret the data in order to get important information out of that? And if the answer is no, then it means that we need some sort of support. And the second reason why AI is developing faster and faster and faster is because the technology of storing data, interpreting data, analyzing data, the cost of this technology is going down dramatically. So you have on one end the capability of a huge amount of data that can be uh, condensed and managed at a cost of a fraction than the one that was 10 or 20 years ago. Just to give you an idea, a little bit of humor, is imagine that the Beetle, if the car automotive was developing at the same power and speed of the IT technology, you would have a car that today will run at that kind of speed, 180,000 kilometers per hour. Uh, it will cost three cents to be built and will run forever for life and gas. This is the proportion you can have between a car and one of those microchips to show what is the impact that you can see nowadays. And, uh, and also in terms of capacity, you all use this, so at least you remember what they were, and you can see that in almost 10 years you have 1,000 times the storage capacity in the same little device. So the cost of storage goes down, the cost of analyzing goes down, the storage capacity increases dramatically, and this is why it's pumping and then the capability of using data is growing and growing. The third element that I would like to say is that we probably need to agree on three aspects from my point of view on data. One is the size, the other one is the frequency, and the other one is the type. So it's no longer the, um, I don't want to mess it up, it's no longer the, the type, we don't have any more table, database, but as we said before, we have images, uh, videos, web, structure, and structured data, which creates all the information that we have. The second point is the, the frequency. We don't work anymore in batch. We don't analyze data and decide what to do the day after or hours after, but we more, go more and more towards the near time or real time information. I have data, I'm entering a store, I receive an information on my phone, say, would you like to have a financing for the TV that you're looking at? That is real time information, the fact that they knew I was wandering around the web, they knew logistically I'm entering the store, they knew I have an interest and I'm looking at something, and then I get an immediate information for possible financing. So you go from batch, to real-time information. And the third is the size, obviously. More, the biggest the size, the more complicated is the analysis. So if we agree that more and more we move towards something unstructured, more towards machine-to-machine uh, -machine data, more towards something which is impossible to manage from a human point of view, then we need to accept the fact that AI is irreversible. We like it or not, but it's fundamentally irreversible. Without that, probably most of the activities that we do to nowadays will no longer be feasible. So 
moving on, when I said at the beginning, I said, we need to ask ourselves, why do I do it? Why do I use artificial intelligence? And you can see from these examples, so you can pick and choose whichever you like. I just highlight a few. Facebook decided to use artificial intelligence and big data analysis in order to generate a, a volume, uh, sorry, a business model which generates almost 8 billion revenues per annum. So from data, they decided to use data in order to generate revenues, not just to make a social um, playground. Other companies, like for example, um, UPS, they decide to use the data in the for artificial intelligence in order to make predictive model in order to save costs on gasoline. And the result was, you can read it, I mean, you cannot read it, but I can do it for you. By doing that, they were able to reduce the usage of mileage and gallons by almost 8.4 million gallons per, an per annum. Oh, sorry, on a daily basis, on a daily route. So you can imagine the business model, the usage of data, the usage of artificial intelligence, the fixing of the routes, help them to bring down the cost of mileage, therefore usury and maintenance of the tracks, but also the gallons that they can enable for day. So these are just some of the examples. So what is happening since I come from the financial industry? What is it happening in the financial industry? Are they ready or not? Uh, and this is also valid for any kind of regulated environment. The excuses until today is, yeah, but financial industry is a regulated environment. Yes, but the economic environment is not ideal. Yeah, but the customers are not ready. They don't want to talk to the machine. Therefore, postpone the issue, right? And what I say is that this is not true. We just saw before the airlines. The airlines is a heavily regulated environment, and yet it needs to change in order to provide information. Even the example that Lars gave you before, that you enter the airport and they know that there is predictive availability of upgrade. For airlines, it's better to sell an upgrade of 50 euro the last minute instead of having that place vacant. Right? And that is immediate benefit for the clients and also for the company. So the financial industry should move. And why should it move? Because the status quo is down there. Banks always think in terms of brick and mortar. Right? Whatever we sell, whatever we suggest, whatever financial product and service is still in the brain, uh, brain or the mind setting that has to be sold between the familiar uh, branches structure, the, the representative, the, the sales force, and never beyond. And now with the technology and the regulation, what is changing and what we see also in the financial industry, especially in fintech, that the new business model, they go beyond the domestic market. There's absolutely no reason to stay within the same boundaries if the approach with the clients is digital and not any more physical. And therefore, the, event, the, the evolution of the financial industry goes either in the direction of free open market or open domestic market, but for sure, it will no longer be confined in a traditional way that we operate. The second element, which is not technological by regulation, and this is very complicated, but I will try to make it simple, is the so-called PSD2. PSD2 is Payment Service Directed 2, which means that from now on, from 2018, means now on, the European Commission decided that also non-financial services can have access to your bank data. So just to ask a question, for example, how many of you, in all honesty, when you download an application, any app, and you have always the terms and condition. How many of you, raise your hand, read the terms and condition before accepting? Do you read truly already? <laughs> Good. So until today, there was no problem at all, because until today, you download an application, you accept terms and condition, it can be anything. It can be Amazon Prime, it can be Facebook, it can be uh, Snapchat, anything that you do, you download and accept. From today, those terms and condition will probably have at the end a question to say, do you allow me to have access to your information, your bank account? And if you say yes, you accept the terms and condition, and the bank is obliged to provide the information of your account to that third service provider. The moment they do that, what they have is they already they have all the big data available, plus because you give the consent through PSD2, they will have access to your bank information, and then you enter in a competitive environment because non-banking financial providers can provide at this point alternatives to your bank. The banks becomes a commodity, all they do provide data, and somebody else provided services on behalf of the bank. So the competitive environment will change dramatically from 2018 going forward because the players that normally deal with big data will have also the missing link, the transactional data from the banks. And this will be the major change and impact. So some banks are thinking of doing something with AI or some thinking about doing something with, uh, with big data, but only most of them are thinking, but nobody is really systematically doing it. So as I said before, the question is any kind of industry, not only financial industry, the first question you need to ask yourself, why do you want to use artificial intelligence? Because you want to acquire customers, because you want to have retention, or do you want to have a deeper customer relationship? Because the point of contest, the physical point of contest with your clients are less and less and less. 
I was in San Francisco last year and I heard Adidas, uh, the, the shoe maker, and uh, they had a huge jump in their sales because they made a big investment in artificial intelligence, which was catering to the clients that normally use any kind of social network. Because what they did, they saw that clients normally go on the website and look for a pair of shoes. In our normal life, when we are on the phone, in 30 seconds, probably you receive a, a message, a chat, a WhatsApp, you're distracted. So what do you do? You exit the website, answer to your friends and family, or whatever you're doing, and then you forget to go back. So what they did somehow with artificial intelligence, they record, they know exactly at what point in time you stopped your search on the website of Adidas, so that when you come back a day after, two hours later, three days later, you don't have to go back anymore at the beginning and make your search, but your search starts automatically from your preference that you had manifested three days ago. And that created sort of an engagement, which of course increased immediately the sales. The client felt at one point it was a personalized contact with their device on something they did three days ago, and then they noticed it was continuity three days later. So just an example of how things can improve with the usage of artificial intelligence. Uh, the last point, so we agree, of course, we are far away. That's why many companies are far away, because they don't interpret correctly the big data. They're stuck on batch, they're stuck on transactional data, and they're stuck on small size. And that's why many companies need to make this investment. Um, another example of a company that used data in order to provide financial inclusion is the, is the Chinese company, Zen Financial, which is part of Alibaba. In China, almost 75% of the people will not be eligible to have any credit, simply because there are no data about these people. Right? And then what they did through the social activity, social scanning, they were able to 350, 900 points from social chat, uh, WeChat, to have a profile of these people to understand is this person eligible to receive credit or not. So this is an example of usage of data in this case, of course, to create a business model, but also to create financial inclusion of people that otherwise would not have any access to credit. Good luck finding the right player, but the point I want to make is that there are plenty of opportunities out there that can facilitate any single sector, no matter it's aviation, logistic, uh, insurance, medical, chemical, and so forth. This is an example of monetization of data, because many of us always say, how do I monetize the data? An example that I wanted to put here is from Uber. We all use Uber, or we have used Uber, we like it or not, but Uber now is entering into the monetization of data, because the fact that we we were talking before about who owns the data. If I book Uber, that's my information, right? But at the same time, Uber now is making available this data to Starboot, hotel chain, or also to Lufthansa. Because if I'm a Lufthansa, miles and more, so I'm a frequent flyer, and I go to New York, and I use Uber, Uber is giving information to Lufthansa. On that day, I went from my home to the airport, and from the airport to the hotel, and I did not fly Lufthansa. Uber doesn't say they didn't fly Lufthansa, just tell information to Lufthansa, I'm going to the airport to New York. And then Lufthansa knows that the matching on that day, I didn't fly with Lufthansa. So if I'm a frequent flyer, most likely Lufthansa wants to know why, and maybe will give me an offer next time to try to recatch me again. And the same with Starwood Hotel, if I go to hotels, but somehow I take a car to go to the hotel, but it's not a Starwood. So this is an example of monetization of data, which of course each of you can think how you can share with the industries at this point, not with the clients, the potential input. Sorry. Now I'll just show a video. Probably um, it was mentioned already today. There was a, a, a little video on uh, Google Duplex. Uh, I would like to show the other part. It will show one portion, the, the example of a conversation in order to book an hair appointment. And then at the end of the video, I will ask. Oh. Hello, how can I help you? Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. Okay, so the reason I wanted to show this video you saw before 
beside, I think, the greatness, if you want, of the conversation, because you can hardly understand that that person was not a person, right? The real person at the hair salon was talking to a natural language process, artificial intelligence. You can see the conversation was so natural. But I want to show you this, because you can see this was a CEO presenting a couple of days ago, I guess. And they presented thinking that this was absolutely a wonderful result and showing how powerful the machine was. I can guarantee you, three hours later, it was bashed. Because people did not like the fact that, on the other hand, they didn't know that they were talking to a machine. And now Google has to adjust the fact that they are really almost uh, asking for forgiveness or asking for excuse that in the future releases, they will always make sure that the people, on the other hand, know that it's a machine talking to a human being. So it's interesting to see that we, technologically we reach a point of non-capability, say, distinguishing, am I talking to a human being or an artificial intelligence machine? And now somehow is what we call good evil versus bad evil, right? So we thought it was a good evil, somebody's complaining, and now they have to fix the artificial intelligence in order to make it good evil again. But I think this is good. It, good evil, what do you mean by good evil? Good, vi uh, uh, good hype evil, right? You have the good hype, so people get excited, that's good. And then the moment some people get excited, somebody else gets bad vibes, bad hype, and goes against that, right? And so because of that, in your society, you always have some people that think it's good, some people think it's bad. But I think this is a natural cycle, because technologically, you can fix it, right? It's not always impossible. And I think it's good that we have this discussion, because we will never have people thinking the same way about artificial intelligence. But as long as we perfect it, then also the, the point that Benny was making, I don't agree with this kind of fear. Technology always brings changes, and then we need to accept them as much as we can. Anyway, I'll move forward briefly if I have a few seconds. Not because I want to talk about blockchain, but because blockchain somehow is connected to the concept of data, and without data and artificial intelligence, also blockchain would not exist. It is not Bitcoin, so if you think it's Bitcoin, it's not. Uh, there are different kind of applications. You can believe it or not what the consultants say. Uh, the point also here, I wanted to focus on this aspect. There are a lot of investment now in blockchain in the world, some of them in smart cities, uh, smart grids, uh, port authorities, logistics, and so forth. Dubai, for example, wants to be the most advanced city in the world by 2020, having uh, public services completely uh, dealing with, uh, with blockchain. And the same, for example, there is uh, Wangxia Group, it's a Chinese uh, conglomerate in automotive. They are thinking of building electric cars. The point is, how do electric cars recharge themselves instantly at the electric pole or traffic light? So you can have a machine-to-machine -machine charge, wireless. The point is, how do you pay? And you can pay with blockchain, because with blockchain, you know that that uh, device, that battery, belongs to that car and belongs to me. And that pole, electric pole, the traffic light, belong to the city, belong to the city hall. And then you can have a payment immutable and uh, irreversible. So these are just examples. We talk about, I want to skip this one. Uh, the point about blockchain is that you can fix a lot of things. You can decide to do efficiency in the process. You can decide to change and make revolution in mortgages. If you go in the Nordic countries already, they have the entire catastro equivalent in Italy. So the, the register of uh, uh, the houses, which is totally digital. But at that point, if you have it already digital, then you don't need a notary anymore. Bad for some categories, good for some others. And uh, also the identity management is a big issue that is uh, currently developed. So what I'm just uh, want to focus on is on the trade finance. Uh, some of you maybe are involved in transportation, logistic, uh, and what happens is no matter what you have, no matter if you you import and export t-shirts or tractors or refrigerators or, or medical equipment, inevitably you have a huge amount of actors. You have the importer, you have the exporter, you have the freight forward, you have the customs, you have the port authorities, uh, you have the certificate of origin, you have the insurance, you have the, the banks. All these are sharing the same documentation right now in a manual way. So it doesn't matter if I transfer t-shirts or tractors, I have normally despised the documents. A lot of operational risk because every actor has to send a piece of that document, which means forgery, mistakes, operational inefficiencies, delays, and so forth. The goal right now is to transform everything in a digital way, but not only transforming digital, but through blockchain, you make those information automatically available to the actors that have a right to have access to. So you don't transfer the documentation from point to point, 
you make it to the node, and that node makes that information available to have as right of access. And that eliminates a lot of operational risk. So the combination, if you want data, artificial intelligence, blockchain, IoT, they're all converging little by little in a, in a fast way. I work for this company we trade, is owned by nine banks. Uh, the idea also here, I don't want to focus on technology, but it's just an example of how technology sometimes needs partnership. Without partnership, you don't have a critical mass, you don't have the capability of developing the way you would like to. So in, uh, in this sense, sorry, in this sense, the reason to start with nine banks was to have 11 countries covered, because what we are building now is a platform that will be launched and will be ma ma made available through nine banks, through 11 countries, to all the companies and clients of these countries, these banks. But we're not stopping there. The idea is then to make it available to all the other banks, so that at least we create a uniform acceptance, uh, which will create a new standard of doing the trade finance. What I want to show is that we started here, we trade as an email company, but at the same time we are doing that, there are also other companies that are working in similar infrastructure, not the similar products, completely different products, but the same technology, the same concept, digitization, availability of information, smart contract. And it's interesting to see that if I know that Boeing is working on that and Maersk is going with that, at the same time, a completely project which can interact with each other, then the next step is that all the actors of the banks, all the actors that gravitate around Boeing, uh, suppliers, providers, insurance, all the actors that provide solutions in, around uh, uh, Maersk will inevitably use the same infrastructure, the same platform. So, boy, uh, so at this point, the blockchain becomes a little bit like the HTTPS protocol. We don't know what it is, but we use it, right? And then we have applications, we have videos, and uh, something that we could not even Im imagine 20 years ago was working. So this is the idea, if you want, with, uh, with, uh, beside blockchain. That's why I wanted to introduce it in order to explain the, the valuable. We're not alone here, if you want, just to give you an idea that many, many industries are really focusing on this. So it can be in the banking, in the consumer, automotive, aerospace, logistic, insurance, uh, uh, fashion, just because they see the potential. And that's why I want to conclude the combination of data, artificial intelligence, and blockchain, I hope will help us to converge towards a common ground. Thank you. Thank you. Roberto, uh, before you walk off stage, yeah. and we'll come back for a conversation later, your last example in WeTrade, you're, so you're, you're attempting to provide an entirely new platform yeah. for tracking global trade. Is that accurate? Yeah. So there are going to be a lot of entities that benefit. There are going to be a number that don't benefit or that are perhaps threatened by what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, what are you seeing so far about how to, how to seed the market, how to, how to introduce something this uh, with a huge opportunity for efficiency but also a lot of complexity in the transition? It is complex for sure, and you need also to establish what is the business model, right? We decided to use a business model that still caters to banks for the simple fact that we use banks in order to onboard clients. We don't have to go through the, what do we call KYC, the know your clients, the dental money laundering. It would be stupid on our side to approach the clients directly and go through all the hurdles on, right. from the, the regulation point of view, regulatory issue. Yeah. But at the same time, if you think about it, this is also a burden, because if I don't have banks willing to join, I cannot join the clients. So now we are testing the market. If we see that the banks are willing to join, then we'll keep with this business model. If the banks are reluctant, then sorry, we have to go directly to the clients. But right. already you have these nine banks? We already have nine, which yeah. already is a critical mass, but it's not sufficient, right? Mm -hmm. Which means if you are a client of uh, HSBC in the UK and you want to deal with Intesa instead of Unicredit in Italy, theoretically you can't, right? Unless mm -hmm. Intesa also becomes a part of the scheme. I right? see. So we are extended the scheme and the faster the better, but if we see there is reluctance in the market, of course we need to create a solution which ultimately favors not the banks, but the clients of the ecosystem. Is there, so to go from zero to all of global trade yeah. is a pretty big step. It's a is big there step. an interim step of some sort of, that you're taking? There is an interim step, and that's why we decided, first of all, to start Europe only, not because mm -hmm. we will exclude the rest, because we do realize that without the rest of the continents it doesn't make any sense. But you know, you, you can have two approaches in every technological development you, you, you try to pursue. Either you start from the wedding cake, right? And it will take forever just to build it, and you don't know if it's going to work or not. Or you start from uh, the muffin, right? And then for sure you're going to be able to... The muffin, <laughs> right? And then you produce it, and then hopefully you have an immediate impact and understanding if there's acceptance. Great, right, great. So well, thank you. We'll bring you back on sure. stage later okay. on. Thank Grazie. Ciao. Grazie. Ciao. Thank you.